Hello, my name is Kathleen Sarraza and I am the event coordinator for Crime Busters. Today I will be going through the Crime Busters event coach training. So this is just a short introductory slide. We'll be going through a lot of information about how you can help your students get through the Crime Busters event successfully. So introducing the Crime Busters event, there is a fictional crime scene where the students are part of the forensic unit and their job is to determine who committed the crime using evidence found at the crime scene. The official tournament dates for this event is Saturday, May 13th of this year, and team sizes for this event will be one or two students. The time for this event will be 30 minutes in which they have uh, to determine who uh, committed the crime at hand. There are six types of evidences that the students will be given. Part one consists of powders. Part two consists of ink samples, which is where chromatography comes in. Parts three through five are different kinds of prints left at the scene, specifically fingerprints, footprints, and tire prints. And part six will be an unspecified evidences. There will always be five suspects that the students can choose from to implicate for the crime, and they can implicate either one or two suspects. Given materials for this event are as follows. They will be given a list of powders as well as the actual powders. They will also be giving materials to study the powders, such as tap water, vinegar, and iodine solution. They will also be given extra plastic cups, wooden spoons, toothpicks, and black construction paper. As for the chromatography section, they will be given a chromatogram with ink samples as well as rubbing alcohol. There will also be uh, prints printed in a packet for the three different kinds of prints previously listed. Finally, there will be the exam sheet with all the questions and a zip grade form to record the answers to some of those questions. Luckily, for the zip grade form, uh, the school name, the event, as well as the tournament, um, they will be competing in, as well as the um, student's team number will be pre-labeled on the zip grade, but the students will have to fill out their school name, team number, and their names on the actual event sheet, on the actual exam sheet. Just for ease of grading, please make sure they know to fill out uh, their names on the exam sheet. Here's a quick overview of how they should be filling out these sheets. They should have um, at least six circles in the powder identification section. There may be more than one powder in each cup, but I'll get into that later. But please make sure they uh, circle in each row what the identity of the powders are since there are six powders, so hence the six circles at least. In terms of the multiple choice uh, section in the zip grade form, please make sure that they answer each question on the second sheet of the exam sheet in their zip grade form because I've had people not fill out certain portions of the zip grade form and I'll go over this in scoring later, but they will lose points if it's not recorded on the zip grade. There will also be tiebreaker questions on the second page of the exam sheet, so please make sure that they fill out both the powder identities as well as the tiebreaker question if they have time on the actual exam sheets, and then they answer the zip grade um, questions on the actual zip grade bubble sheets. The test will be out of 100 points, and as I said before, unanswered questions will be automatically marked wrong, except for the tiebreaker questions. 
if two teams correctly answer all tiebreaker questions and they're still tied in terms, the, in terms of the amount of points, their chromatogram quality will determine the tiebreaker. Materials to bring to either the practice event or the actual tournament event are as follows. Please make sure your students have goggles. Each of them have goggles if it's a team of two, because we don't want anything getting into their eyes. Even though these are household products, we just want them to be very safe. If either student doesn't appear with goggles, they will not be permitted to um, to compete in the event. So please make sure that they have goggles. Also, please make sure that they have at least two pencils per team, preferably more because one pencil will be dedicated towards uh, the chromatography portion of this event. So please make sure they come with their own pencils. Also, they are allotted a two-sided one, uh, one sheet of notes or one index card and the maximum uh, size of this cheat sheet will be 8.5 by 11 inches. You can write down information that will help them answer the powder section, the chromatography section, or the print section. Um, just make sure that this is either written out or typed within the limits for the sheet. Also, make sure that your team has a magnifying glass as well as uh, them remembering their team number because that will help them um, in terms of where to find their specific uh, exam uh, materials since the zip grades will be pre-labeled with their team number and their school name. Also, thankfully, masks are optional now. Um, in terms of goggles, pencils, and magnifying glasses, um, it's mostly up to the students and uh, event coaches to make sure they have these materials. I may have extras on hand, but it's not always guaranteed. So I'm really pushing for uh, these materials to be present with the students when they come in. Now, um, when this was occurring on Saturday, we had some questions and I said I would take questions after each section. So after uh, the overview of uh, how this event works and um, what the students need and whatnot, some questions that were asked are as follows. Can the goggles actually uh, be safety glasses? That was one question. And to answer that, yes, they can be safety glasses. If the students wear prescription glasses though, I um, require them to have goggles that go over their glasses so they can still see and still be safe. Um, another question was, um, can the note sheet be typed or should it be written? As I said before, the note sheet can be typed or written. The only caveat to this is that it has to fit between the 8.5 by 11 inch uh, size restriction and there can't be any sticky notes or any uh, compartments that they can lift up uh, to store more information. So everything has to be on that one sheet, regardless of if they choose to use an index card or um, a regular 8.5 by 11 sheet, and um, they can type or write it out. Is there a link for purchasing goggles from the Science Olympiad website? I believe there is a link on the Science Olympiad website to buy uh, materials for this event, such as goggles or actual practice materials, which I'll be getting into uh, later on in this presentation. And that's it for um, what we've covered so far. So after each part, I'll be answering questions that were asked in the chat or uh, during the actual event that occurred last Saturday. So we're going on to the powder identification part. And as, I, as it um, is listed in the title, you have to identify and match the powder found at the evidence to one or more of the powder samples given by uh, suspects A through E. There can be up to three powders in one cup. So for instance, there could be three powders in cup A, two powders in cup B, one powder in cup C. It's not in any given order. 
in terms of um, this event, again, you have to match the identity of the powder or powders in cup one to uh, the suspect's cups and uh, parts one of this event. And there are materials that are given uh, to help study these powders to find the identity of them. Um, a good rule of thumb for this part of the Crime Busters event is that they should use the wooden spoons to scoop out, let's say, one spoonful of powder from cup one. They can then put it in one of the extra cups and then they'll drop a few drops of water into that cup containing the tiny portion of cup one powder. They will see if uh, there are any reactions to um, the water, if it melts, if, if the powder dissolves, if the powder doesn't, so on and so forth. It's also good for um, small portions of the powder in cup one to be put on the black construction paper to then be observed by the magnifying glass. Um, we're looking for characteristics of the powder's appearance, such as is it all the same color? Are there multiple colors within the powder sample? Are the granules small? Are they chunky? So we're looking at physical um, characteristics of the powders as well as chemical reactions that happen between each of the um, liquids given towards the powder. You'll be repeating this for the five other cups. So if your students need extra material such as cups, toothpicks and spoons and black paper, uh, they are allowed that. They are not given extra powder cups, so it's in their best interest to ration out the um, powders in each cup. Please keep in mind that there may be more than one powder in any given cup, so this is where your cheat sheet comes in, where you can write down observations during your practice of what did this powder look like by itself? What did it look like when uh, there were um, small portions of water, vinegar, or iodine added to um, the powder that you're studying, so they have an idea of how to identify the powder. Then they can match the um, identity of the powder in cup one to whatever suspects have the same uh, powder or a combination of powders. There are 10 types of powders that are uh, fair game for this event, such as baking soda, calcium carbonate, cornstarch, flour, gelatin, granulated sugar, so on and so forth. There are combinations of powders that are restricted in this event, so I will never mix any combination of Alka-Seltzer, baking soda, and or calcium carbonate because these powders react too similarly to the liquids that are given and they look similar, so it's very hard to discern when they're mixed together. Also, I will never mix cornstarch and flour. So when you're practicing what these powders look like and how they react to the three liquids, you don't have to practice these combinations. In terms of answering the questions on the exam sheets, please make sure that they, they identify the uh, powders in each cup, as well as answer question one on the zip grade uh, form which is which suspects uh, powder matches cup one. Now, some questions from this previous part with powders is, first, what is a good ratio, ratio of powder to drops? So one, one wooden spoonful of powder should correspond to as little liquid needed to study the powder. So I'd say probably one or two drops see if uh, there's anything different about your um, spoonful of powder sample. You can use a toothpick to mix it around. If the student uh, needs a bit more liquid to see if there's any reaction, they can do so. But the objective is to uh, preserve the amount of powder you have per cup and to not drown the powder when you um, actually study it or you won't find any useful information other than does it actually dissolve. Another question was, is the black paper construction paper? Yes, it's just a uh, black construction paper. Can they bring blank sheets of paper to write notes for um, the event? 
I will not permit any um, blank sheets uh, coming in with the students just to even out the playing field. Uh, one nice thing is that the prints packet with the fingerprints, footprints, and tire prints will be single sided so they can use the blank back uh, of each sheet in the prints packet to write down any notes they need for this section. Are the powders equal amounts in the cup? So if there are two or more powders in a cup, they will be an equal amount within that one cup. Meaning if I have a mixture of cornstarch and gelatin, uh, they will be a 50-50 amount. Each uh, powder cup will be filled either halfway or three fourths of the way to the top. So um, as I said before, if there are two powders in a cup, they will be an equal amount filled to that 50 or 75% full line. If there are three powders, they will uh, be in equal parts. So it'll be uh, one third each to make up that um, filled amount of a cup. Another question was, would the powders in cup one be mixed or separated? All the powders within each cup will be mixed. Specifically in cup one from the evidence, it would also be mixed if there's more than one. Um, so it could be that any of the cups could have just one powder or any of the cups could have multiple powders. Now we'll move on to part two with uh, chromatography using the ink samples. And the objective of this part is to match the ink sample um, two to one or more of the ink samples given by the suspects. And in the presentation, I denote these uh, ink samples as lanes because after you process the chromatography paper with the ink uh, through dipping it in a cup full of alcohol, you actually see that the ink will separate into different colors and the ink will travel up the chromatography paper. Please note that these lanes um, are a crude representation um, there are no extra chromatograms given in this event, so please make sure that your students are uh, familiar with how to run through a chromatography um, sample. I'll go through that very briefly. Make sure also that they turn in the chromatography paper with the exam sheets because they will be graded on that both in terms of the actual exam as well as any tiebreakers. Now, uh, I will go through how to actually conduct chromatography. And um, chromatography is basically the separation of a material into its components. In this case, we're using alcohol to do that. So for the first step of chromatography, we're going to take the chromatography paper, which has a hole punch at the top, and gently push a pencil through the hole so that it's at about the center of the pencil. Then you will take the pencil with the paper and lower it into the cup full of rubbing alcohol. Please make sure that the ink lines on the chromatography paper are above the level of the rubbing alcohol. If you dip the chromatography paper too far, and let's say the lines are below the level of the rubbing alcohol, then you will just have the ink bleed into the rubbing alcohol and you won't get those nice lines that are nice lanes that are depicted in um, this example here. Also, please make sure that when they lower the chromatography paper into the cup, that um, the paper is straight, meaning it's not crooked in any way because um, chromatography done successfully relies on straight lines instead of crooked lines. And if you have the paper enter at an angle, you'll have the ink travel up the paper also at an angle. Now, after uh, you have to wait about 10 minutes to have the uh, ink travel up the paper to have it um, separate into components. Please make sure that the students um, will monitor the chromatogram closely while it's in rubbing alcohol and don't move the cup uh, with 
the paper in it because that may disturb uh, the formation of um, straight lanes on your paper. After about 10 minutes, have them lift out the pencil with the paper and gently take out uh, the pencil from the chromatography paper to let it dry. Again, they will be graded on straight, clean lanes and separation of ink per lane. And um, looking at the example again, uh, the lanes shown are a crude representation of what their chromatogram will look like after being um, dipped in alcohol for about 10 minutes. Please, but please make sure that um, you actually complete this for yourself so you know what they look like. In terms of answering the chromatography portion of Crime Busters, make sure that they answer, answer question number two um, on the second page of the exam sheet on the chroma, sorry, the uh, zip grade form. So questions for chromatography um, from the chat on Saturday are as follows. Can they use a smartwatch to time 10 minutes by setting a timer? And I'm going to uh, say they are not allowed to use a smartwatch because uh, we don't want any communication uh, device uh, to be used during the event. They can use their smartwatch as uh, a timepiece only, meaning they can only check the time uh, that it is instead of actually setting a timer. Another question is, are they creating the ink lines or are they already made? So the chromatography paper that they'll be given will look like this or roughly like this. So the ink lines will be made by me um, since I make all the chromatograms. Are they simply just putting this pencil in and placing it into the alcohol uh, to complete chromatography? Yes. But uh, there is finesse to this. Again, you have to make sure that the chromatography paper is perpendicular or like 90, making a 90 degree angle with the level of the rubbing alcohol so that you get those nice clean lanes instead of them looking uh, squiggly. Another question was, should you use different brands of the same color ink? And my, question, my answer to that question is yes because um, even though black ink may look the same, different companies have different formulas that make up this black ink. So after you put the, um, after you expose the ink to alcohol, you'll see that different brands of ink will actually have different colors that make up that black, such as um, different shades of blue. You can also have green, purple, um, just straight black, I've seen a lot. So it's in yours and your students' best interest to use different brands of the same color ink to see how the separation is different. Also, um, I had a little uh, interaction section or a few interaction sections between me and the coaches um, to help actually answer some of the questions on the exam. So one question that I posed to the event coaches was, uh, which ink sample from the suspects matches ink sample two? And in this case, the answer would be only B. And that's because it's the right shade of uh, blue between both ink sample two and B. E uh, is somewhat similar in terms of color to um, ink sample two, but the thing is, is that it's too dark. So in this case with chromatography, you really have to make sure that there are the same uh, colors um, between both the evidence found at the crime scene and whatever suspect you wanna put down for um, question two on the exam. Also make sure that the pattern in which the ink separates is the same. Again, this is where practice really comes in handy because you want to have experience seeing what an actual chromatography paper looks like. Uh, practice, practice, practice. That is the mantra that one should have when preparing for this uh, event. 
So now I will move on to parts three through five of Crime Busters, which is the prints section. And uh, the prints section, again, they will be given fingerprints, footprints, and tire prints. And they will match the prints found at the crime scene to the appropriate suspect or suspects. And this is where the magnifying glass comes in handy. Partial prints and obscured prints are, part, are possible in this event. By partial prints, I mean that instead of having a full uh, thumbprint, for example, there may only be like half a thumbprint uh, that was found at the crime scene that they then have to match to uh, one of the um, sets of fingerprints um, given by the suspect. And the exam will be set up so that there will be whatever is found at the crime scene at the top of, let's say, part three. And then there will be a full set of fingerprints um, for suspects A through E. So expect, so expect five sets of fingerprints to choose from. Um, again, the magnifying glass will help uh, the students see closely what the fine details of the fingerprint or footprint or tire print is so they can match it to the appropriate um, uh, suspect set. And in terms of answering the prints questions, there will be questions three through five on the exam sheets. Make sure that they uh, bubble in the um, answers on the zip grade form. And questions from uh, this portion of the presentation were, is there a clock in the room? Yes, there will be a clock in the room. And if there isn't one, then I will display the time in some manner um, for the students to use since this is a timed event. Another question was, can you give an example of how we should study fingerprints? Will it ask for types such as whorls, etc.? cetera? And um, as I said, before, since we have partial and full prints, I think the best way to study uh, for this section is to actually take an ink pad and um, put your fingerprints on a sheet of paper, then practice maybe only um, putting a half fingerprints um, on a different sheet of paper and then studying how you can uh, match the half finger fingerprint to the uh, full set of fingerprints. And um, I, another question that comes in uh, is magnifying glasses, what kind they should be using. I'll also answer this in the FAQs of the website, but uh, magnifying glasses, I don't have many restrictions on those other than please don't bring in a microscope. And um, the magnifying glasses can have a light if they so choose. It can be any size and it can have um, a, a, an additional magnification because there could be one magnification for the uh, large lens, and then there are ones that have a uh, small portion of that lens being a different magnification. So that's what's allowed. Again, no microscopes, please and thank you. Now we're going on to part six of the event, which is unspecified evidence. And really, this is the wild card of the event. Um, it can be almost anything within the scope of what an elementary school student can do. Some examples from the past are, but not limited to, having hair strands made out of yarn, handwriting samples that they have to match. Uh, there were also pH tests. Um, this varies year to year. And one question that I got from this part was, do they actually have to test pH? And it's possible, but again, make sh uh, this is a elementary school event, so it's not going to be the same as the high school event where the um, tasks involved are more advanced. So just keep that in mind. In terms of answering the unspecified evidence uh, question, it will be number six on the exam sheets. 
and please just make sure they uh, bubble in their answer for number six on the zip grade form. Part seven will be the crime identification section. And this is where they implicate one or two suspects. In order to answer this question correctly, you can use the number of times the suspect shows up in the zip grade answer to answer question seven. If you have two suspects implicated, but not saying there will always be two suspects implicated, um, they will have the same number of zip grade answers. Please make sure that your students answer this question, question number seven on the zip grade, because I've seen students lose uh, points on their total score just because they didn't actually bubble in an answer for this question. And um, this was another interaction section between me and the coaches. So uh, here's one example of a, a zip grade form after a student completed, not an actual student, a theoretical student completed um, parts one through six. So who do you think actually did the crime based on the answers in the zip grade uh, form? I'll give you a few moments. And in this case, uh, the two suspects that would be implicated are A and C because uh, they both appear, appear twice in the zip grade answers. So in this case, the student will bubble in A and C for question seven. Another example will be example two. So who uh, would be implicated in this case based on the zip grade answers? I'll give you a few moments. And in this case, only suspect C would be implicated because suspect C appeared three times in the zip grade answers. Um, in this case, suspect A would not be implicated because he only appeared twice. In order to have two suspects implicated, you have to have each of them appear the same amount of times in your zip grade answers. So in this case, only C would be bubbled in for question seven. Now for example three, who would be implicated based on the answers? I'll give you a few moments. And in this case, only suspect B would be implicated because he appears three times, or she, or they appear three times. Um, no one else had the same amount of uh, times implicated in the previous questions. So in this case, the student would only um, bubble in B. As I said before, um, the the criminal implication question is number seven, and they just need to bubble in their answer on zip grade question seven. Now some questions from part seven are as follows. Can there be more than one criminal? Yes, there can be more than one criminal, but not always. There is a maximum of two total criminals that can be implicated. And I think that's... Oh, another question from part seven was, will the answer actually be two suspects or will the students narrow it down to one by critical thinking? In this case, um, two suspects will only be implicated if they appear the same amount of times in the zip grade uh, answers. Otherwise, if there's only one that means that you go with the criminal that or the suspect that was implicated the most through their zip grade answers. And that was it for questions in part seven. In terms of tiebreaker question or questions, they will always be provided on the uh, second sheet of the exam sheets. And as I said before, if two teams correctly answer all tiebreaker questions, the chromatogram quality determines the tiebreaker. When the students are finished, um, they should ensure that all questions are answered um, and make sure they do the tiebreaker if 
uh, they have time, they will not be marked down if they enter the tiebreaker wrong. Also, please make sure that their name is on the chromatogram that they completed before turning it in. And uh, the past year, we have had labels with the school name and the team number that we have given to the uh, students to put on the chromatogram. So when they finish, uh, they can when they finish the chromatogram and it's dried, they can raise their hand and then ask for uh, the label with their team number and elementary school name so they can put it on the chromatography paper. If your students finish uh, early, make sure that they raise their hand and they turn well, they should make sure that they raise their hand and turn in their materials to me or one of my volunteers. At the 30 minute mark, everyone will be turning in uh, their materials uh, again to one of the volunteers or me, and they will be turning in the exam sheets, uh, the zip grade form, and their chromatography paper. Here are some final notes. Um, this is the link to the Crime Busters website. Um, this presentation will be available on my website as well as this video. So uh, you can click on this link and that'll bring you to uh, my event page. Please start practicing as early as possible. Hands on practice is the best way to prepare for this event. Uh, with the powders, just making sure you know what they look like before and after the liquids are applied. Um, split up the portions of the exam between partners too. So maybe one student will start on the chromatography section while another student will start tackling the powders because we want to use our time efficiently. Also, please ensure that all students have the materials um, they need before the tournament. So make sure they have their goggles, they have their magnifying glasses, they have their pencils and their note sheets. Um, and strategize with your students on how to prepare the note sheet to best help them. Most importantly, have fun with this event. These are the dates, uh, the tentative dates for each of the district practice tournaments. So I will be running a practice tournament at each of these um, events. And I will also be running for uh, the official tournament as well. There are Crime Busters a quick start kits that are available at this link and it they cost $30. They will include all the possible powders for this event, as well as iodine, black paper, droppers, chromatography paper, an ink pad and a magnifier. There are also replenishment kits uh, that include all powders and chromatography paper available at $15 also on this link. Now we'll go through the rest of the questions um, posed throughout this um, uh, event that we did on Saturday. So one question was, will there be a workshop again this year? There will not be a workshop. Uh, there will not be a workshop uh, happening this year, but there are materials on my Crime Busters website that uh, correspond to the workshop done last year. Another question was, what is the, the coach's role on the event date? Can we help the students with anything or we just observe? So in this case, you won't be able to do either because it's solely up to the students during um, the event to complete uh, the tasks at hand. So in this case, you'll see your students before and after the event and you can act as their cheerleaders, really pump them up for this event, get them excited. Also, Please make sure they have everything uh, that they need for the event, goggles, pencils, magnifier, um, note sheets. Um, someone asked how much time is at each station? So they won't be moving between stations. Each team will have their own set of evidence and uh, materials to study the evidence, aka the liquids and the um, construction paper, cups and whatnot. So they won't have to move, they'll be in one place always. Another question was, are there sample tests on the website? There are limited amounts of sample tests on the websites and um, the uh, any sample tests, presentations, 
um, workshops that we have will be available on the website and will be updated. And I think that is it. So in this case, thank you very much for staying with me this whole time and have fun preparing for this event. And I'll see you at the practice tournament and the actual event. So have a good day.